The verses I'm going to read are from Romans 1, verses 18 to 32. Before I do, I wanted to share, this week I've been working on a verse, and it's from Proverbs 4.23, and it says, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything flows through it. And reading this scripture really gave me the context in which uh, that verse was put on my heart to memorize. God's wrath against sinful humanity. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became foolish or fools and exchanged their glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with the lust of one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their errors. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind, so that they do what not be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. We're indebted to Dave for uh, videoing this so that others can uh, be able to see it who can't make it in. Um, today's sermon uh, is titled uh, Worldview. Uh, it's really kingdom worldview, but it's, uh, we're going to be discussing worldview. Now, Carol and I have been married for? 51 years. 51 years. Okay? And I'll be the first to acknowledge that she deserves a lot of credit and maybe some uh, sympathy uh, because we're two very different people. And, uh, and I'm afraid that she bears an, an unequal amount of the burden that comes from those differences. Often those differences lead to a disagreement between the two of us. Not often, but uh, occasionally. Often they, they used to. Now uh, occasionally they do. And uh, these differences, if, if there were a casual observer looking in at our marriage, they'd be scratching their head and saying, I don't understand what's going on. Here's these two people that have lived together for over 50 years. The facts that they're looking at are the same for both of them. Why, why are they arguing, you know, over this thing? Well, that's a good question. 
you know, and it, you know, I'm sure it happens to many of us. <laughs> it's an important question because occasionally these things still arise in our marriage. And invariably, if we can uh, maintain our cool and not get emotional about this, what we discover is we're both looking at these facts from a different viewpoint, from a different viewpoint. And so, well, that's good. What's a viewpoint? Uh, maybe the best way to understand what a viewpoint is is to know a little bit more about Carol and I. Uh, Carol is the oldest of ten children. Uh, there's uh, eight of them still still living. So she's the matriarch. She's the oldest. She's the matriarch and functions as the matriarch of that family. Um, she grew up uh, in an Irish Catholic uh, family and she attended Catholic school throughout her entire schooling career until she got to college. and. Um, and she uh, finished out her uh, secondary school experience at West Philadelphia Catholic Girls High School down in Philadelphia. And she lived in several different neighborhoods in West Philadelphia and uh, Southwest Philadelphia. Now me, I'm a suburban guy, you know. I grew up in the suburbs. I'm the middle of uh, three kids. Um, I attended nothing but public schools. And, uh, and I went to um, Protestant churches, growing up various Protestant churches as I was growing up. Um, Carol's dad is a union millwright. My dad was part of a family business. Uh, the McHughes, that's her maiden name, were uh, Democrats. The Deerings were Republicans, you know. And as if that isn't enough differences. You know, that's a lot of differences to, to bring into a marriage. But, uh, I'm a man, and she, thankfully, is a woman. And that's the biggest difference of all, you know? Yeah. So, um, you know, that, so, so we, we have to work at, at, uh, at putting on these different lenses that we come into marriage with, and, and we have to sort of carefully, you know, take those lenses off a little bit and look at the situation and compromise and that sort of thing. Now, that's not... A scenario you're unfamiliar with, right? Yeah, I mean, most of us have had have had that experience, and when we have that experience in marriage, and we're able to um, successfully navigate through it, you know, love finally triumphs over all and carries the day. So, given the factors that I just mentioned, the type of factors I just mentioned, you might you might term what Carol and I experience as having family viewpoints, family viewpoints, viewpoints the way we look at facts born out of the families that we were raised in. Um, and most of you wouldn't say, well, Jay's right or Carol's wrong. There's no right or wrong here. They're just different. And for the most part, these family viewpoints are harmless for the most part. Now, there's another type of viewpoint, which is much more consequential. That's called the worldview. And what a worldview is, it's the way that people think about the world that they live in. Okay, it's, it's what you think, what you believe personally is driving this world we live in. What are the truths in this world in which we live? That's a worldview, and uh, it can have profound consequences. Profound. And in fact, it is having profound consequences in our lives right now, and we all know that. We know that. I mean, if you wonder why uh, abortion and gay marriage and assisted suicide and no-fault divorce, just to name a few, are the law of the land, and then you say, you know, when I was a child, we didn't even discuss these things. Occasionally, because, well, they weren't the type of things you discussed, but more often than not, because we didn't even think about these things. We hadn't even invented. We, could, we weren't creative enough to even think about some of this craziness that's going on in our life. Well, it's, it's the result of the difference between two uh, specific worldviews that I want to talk about. One is called naturalism, and the other is a biblical worldview. The older of the two... Uh, perhaps is the biblical worldview. It was certainly the worldview that was around when Paul wrote the scripture that Charlie read from there. And, uh, and Paul was anticipating other worldviews, but his argument, and we'll get to one of the verses in there, uh, his, he had an argument against the naturalist worldview and what's wrong with naturalism. Now, naturalism itself, 
what that is, it's a byproduct uh, and, and relatively modern in the last uh, couple hundred years. It's a byproduct of the advancement in science. Now, it's not science itself. Science itself isn't anything bad. Uh, science itself, actually, the science, modern science, is really a creation of of Christian, uh, brilliant Christian uh, science philosophers like Isaac Newton, that's what they call it back then, natural philosophers, that's what they would call themselves, scientists we would call them nowadays, but most of them were Christians and what they were trying to do was determine the rules by which God ran the world. They wanted to have the mind of Christ and, and for, in their particular discipline, having the mind of Christ meant understanding how God uh, ran the world and that's where science came from and they developed this very powerful tool called scientific method. And the scientific method was so powerful for unearthing truth that it's been used for a lot of different things. Now, the problem with the scientific method is um, in the right hands, it's a very powerful tool. In the wrong hands, it can be deceptive. It can be uh, misused uh, deliberately. It can be misused accidentally. Probably the best example of the misuse of the scientific method is this thing called evolution evolution, uh, otherwise called Darwinism, after this, uh, its biggest advocate, Charles Darwin. And in its extreme, uh, what evolution says is that life is created and sustained in all of its complexity without the involvement of God, which is really the definition that leads into the definition of naturalism, which is there's no reality beyond nature and the existence of all things can be explained as a product of natural causes. So that's the naturalist worldview, as opposed to a biblical worldview, which is self-explanatory. It comes right out of the Bible. You read your Bible, that explains how life is, and then that guides your thinking instead of this naturalism. Now, personally, I think naturalism uh, itself could easily coexist along with the biblical worldview, except for one thing, one major difference. And that is a biblical worldview brings with it moral restraints. It brings with it morals. It talks about our behavior and what's the limits of our behavior. Naturalism imposes nothing like this. So as a direct result, uh, those who wish to cast off, you know, all moral restraint, uh, they turn to naturalism as a worldview which can justify their behavior because it doesn't require them to have some moral uh, restraints. Now, none of what I've said so far is new news. It's just not new news. You've heard all this before. Um, naturalism has uh, gained popularity at an accelerating pace. Uh, throughout the last century, when I say the last century, that sounds funny, doesn't it? But that's the 1900s, last century. But it was during the last century that naturalism really g gained speed. But it didn't affect the life of the average American too much because of the influence of the church. The church was a moderating force and it upheld the biblical worldview. And it had answers that said, no, the naturalism, here's the mistakes in naturalism that don't allow it to be an appropriate worldview. But what we're faced with now, and I mean, right now in the last year and leading up to this election, what we're faced with now is just this rampant acceleration of immorality in, in our country, in our country, and it's being enshrined as public policy. We're not only seeing acceleration of immorality, but we're seeing it being made into law, okay, all because of this seismic shift in, in the worldview towards naturalism. So why is this happening? Why all of a sudden do we find ourselves in this, I feel, very uncomfortable position of having to look around at the world in which we live now, and it's a world that is alien to especially those of us in this room who spent their childhood in the 50s or before, and the world was very different. Well, I'm going to go to George Barna now. How many of you have heard of George Barna? Okay, some of you, about half of you. George Barna is the Christian poll, pollster. In other words, he takes polls and studies all the data that he collects and draws conclusions about the world and particularly about the church. And he focuses every once in a while on gathering data to evaluate biblical worldview in the United States. I think he's done it three or four times. Now, he does this by asking questions. 
Um, and, and that's standard for discerning a worldview is you just start asking questions of people about uh, the, the, what they believe and you can discern uh, what their view is. Uh, in researching for this sermon, I, I saw that maybe 4 to 20 seems to be the range of questions that uh, different people ask uh, to determine a worldview. Uh, George Barna, for his worldview studies, chooses six questions, and I'm going to go down those six questions right now, and I think what you'll find is they're not real tight, they're pretty loose, yet some of the results are surprising. Do you believe that absolute moral truth exists? And, and what I'm going to invite you to do is think about that as, as I ask the questions. Do you believe that absolute moral truth exists? Absolute moral truth. Not, there's no gray in between, it's, you know, yes or no. Is the Bible totally accurate? Not in every word that's in there. That's not what he's asking. Totally accurate in all the principles it teaches. Is the Bible totally accurate in all the principles that it teaches? Is Satan considered to be a real being or a force? He'll even, you know, wiggle that far. Or a force or uh, is it, and not merely a sim symbolic. So is Satan real, basically, is the question. That's number three. Number four, is it impossible for a person to earn their way into heaven by trying to be good or do good works? Okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Some of us are answering this. Very good. Did Jesus Christ lead a sinless life? Okay. Now, you know, it's, uh, praise God, I see nodding the heads. You know, <laughs> of course they are. Okay. And the sixth one, I... I out of five, six, is God the all-knowing, all-powerful creator of the world who still rules the universe today? Yes. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, we're having some fun with this, actually. We're, we're actually establishing our own worldview, which I'm going to ask you to do anyhow. A person holding all of these beliefs, that's what George, George Barna said. Okay, if you have all these beliefs, then you're considered to have a biblical worldview. Now, no doubt you could figure out some questions that you'd ask if you were determining that, but we'll just leave it to George Barna because he's a, a very uh, strong Christian and, and he's a very smart man, so he's figured this stuff out. We'll leave his, uh, his questions go. Um, some of what these uh, questions reveal are, are no surprise. Others are very disturbing. Um, so I'm going to give you a couple of the results here. Uh, research indicates that uh, only 10% of American adults, and I'm rounding these numbers out to, so you can make it easier, 10% um, of American adults uh, have, a world, uh, have a biblical worldview. Only 10%. Well, that's not surprising because uh, naturalism is the worldview of almost all of our institutions other than the church. That's the worldview of public schools. That's the worldview of uh, the, the news media. Uh, that's the worldview of everything on TV, uh, pretty much everything that we look at outside the church. Naturalism is the worldview, and remember, naturalism is a thing that allows people to behave any way uh, they want to behave, and matter of fact, we're enshrining that. And a lot of the church, too. Well, we're going to get there. Thanks. You want to preach the sermon? Get up here, bro. I think you could do a better job than me. Okay. All right. That's good. Yeah, but uh, what was surprising... Um, is that uh, people who describe themselves as born again. Now that's, uh, George has, uh, George Barna has to figure out some way to discern the people that they're talking to on the phone or however they're gathering this data, are they uh, w in what we would call the church or not? So he would ask them, are you born again? Or do you know what a born again believer is and are you one, etc." And so people who self-describe as born again only a minority have a biblical worldview, to Ron's point. And, and when I say minority, one in five. One in five answered all those questions uh, in, a, in a way that would indicate they have a, a worldview. One in five people in the church, so we'll switch over to, from born again to church, in the, in the true church, if you will, one in, 20, uh, one in five, 20%, um, have a biblical worldview. Um, <clears throat> naturalism has obviously invaded the church. It's invaded the church. Uh, 
uh, also not surprising but very disturbing, is less than half, less than half of 1% of adults aged 18 to 23. That would mean 1 in 200 young adults have no, uh, they're, they're, let me get this right, one, only 1 in 200 young adults have a biblical worldview in the 18 to 23 branch. Right? And they're voting, you know, they're the future. They're the ones determining our future. Okay, that means they have no uh, worldview basis for moral behavior. Uh, it's no wonder that transgenderism, just to pick one of these things, is, is becoming epidemic. It's crazy. There's this transgenderism, okay? And suicide is one of the leading causes of death among this age group. It's just no surprise. Now, that's their conclusions from, the, from whether or not people answered all the questions correctly. But then if you look at some of the individual questions, it gets a little more disturbing. Slightly less than half of born-again adults believe in absolute moral truth. That means that over half of the church believes that, well, truth, moral truth, moral truth, what's right and what's wrong, isn't absolute. That's very, very hard to believe, but that's what he found. And the reason for this becomes evident when you read that um, one in five born-again believers uh, do not consider the Word of God as being absolute, as, as being uh, true as far as its teachings on moral truth and that sort of thing. And, um, and that's enough. That's enough to impact a church. And that's what our denomination is going through right now. You, you only, it's a minority of people who have a, poor, uh, a low view of Scripture, but they seem to have an outsized influence on, on church governance. It's also not surprising that only a quarter of the general population believe in Satan. Only 25%. Matter of fact, I thought that was rather high, that 25% actually believed in Satan. Um, but the bothersome part is less than half of born-again believers believe in Satan. That's the results of this study. Okay, slightly less than two-thirds of born-again believers strongly believe that Jesus was sinless. That means that about one-third of people that identify themselves as born-again think that Jesus had sin in his life. Well, that's the results when you get down at the question level. And, um, and you know, I, I didn't come here this morning to, to try to give you a downer, but we have to deal with reality and what's going on around us. And, uh, and I think uh, as we approach election day, that I'm not advocating for, you know, how you should vote. Well, I'm just saying at election day, it, you hear so much about all these different things that it just forces it up into your consciousness, so you have to pay attention to it, and you have to be asking yourself, why are we where we are? And, um, and really, we have to ask ourselves why the church is failing in its moderating function. Because remember what I said, naturalism is out there, okay, but it was held back for years by the church having a strong biblical worldview. Uh, but that what's happening is the church's biblical worldview is disappearing and the church is adopting uh, naturalism. And so we're no longer, we're failing miserably at being salt and light. Jesus tells us that we are to be salt and light. Where does he tell us that? In the Sermon on the Mount. Thank you. The Sermon on the Mount. He puts that down as a job description for us. We're to be salt and light in the world, but we're, the church is failing at that. So is the situation hopeless, you know, or is there hope? Well, there is hope. There's a way out of this spiritual debacle, but it depends on one institution, one institution, the family. It depends on the family in order for us to turn this around. The family is um, by far the most influential factor in chi a child's spiritual development. And that's what we're talking about. To turn this around is grabbing hold 
of a younger generation and getting them reoriented and off in the right direction. Now, here's the problem, and this is a quote from Barna. It was a big, much bigger quote, but when I went through this sermon of Carol, she said, yeah, TMI, you know, too much information. So I, I cut this back to just the salient points, and I'm going to read this uh, from you know, quoting George Barna, the pollster. The generational patterns suggest that parents are not focused on guiding their children to have a biblical worldview. One of the challenges for parents, though, is that you cannot give what you do not have, and most parents do not possess such a perspective on life. That's our situation. Okay? But that doesn't have to apply to us in this room or us in this church. That statement is very pessimistic, but it doesn't have to apply to us, and we can have a very positive and different impact. But it's that picture that I just read you, uh, uh, that was a word description, a word picture, it's that picture that caused me to uh, make this a topic of today's sermon. You and I have a God-given responsibility because uh, as many of us in this room are parents, so we have a God-given uh, responsibility to our families and to Parker Ford Church. Look around the room, we're patriarchs, you know, look at the hair, gray hair, you know, silver hair. Uh, we're matriarchs. And in a social sense, we're all elders. And we're elders because we've experienced life. We've experienced, all of us, at least a half a century of life. So we can speak authoritatively into the lives of our family, into the life of this church. We can speak authoritatively, but we can only speak authoritatively if we have a biblical worldview. Now, I hadn't anticipated as I read those things, everybody answering the questions, but that's a good thing uh, because it was telling me is we do have a good, sound, biblical worldview uh, in this room. So uh, I was going to admonish you and say you must examine yourself, but I, I have a sense that you would, uh, you would pass that exam pretty well as far as having a biblical worldview that make sure uh, that you are equipped to speak truth into your family and speak truth into the church. Jesus, you know, when he prayed for us in uh, John 17, he said, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Set us apart with truth. Your word, the Bible, is truth. That's what Jesus prayed for us, for you and I. Okay. Um, do you believe the Bible is true and is God's written word? You know, I'm, I'm sure that everybody in this room would probably say yes to that. You all seem to be nodding that way, which is important because in, in Hebrews, you know, it talks about the power of God's word in our life. Um, it's, uh, it's alive and active, you know, sharper. Charlie can quote this one for us. He has so many times when the men get together. Sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit. And that really divides naturalism and the biblical worldview, soul and spirit, and joint and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. That's the power of God's word. You know, in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given uh, by as God breathed, all scriptures God breathed that comes from God. Are you, so I'm going to ask you, are you studying your Bible so that you know what it says, particularly about the issues of today? Now that's important and you may not score so well in there. Sometimes we consider, well, we're into God's word because we'll open the daily bread and we'll read the little scripture in there and then read daily bread or something like that. That's good. I would absolutely not discourage anybody from doing that. But that's not going to get you to the biblical depth that you get from reading at least a chapter a day and then journaling it. I journal these things and it just comes alive for me. But that's important to have that kind of a biblical anchoring so that you can speak authoritatively into the lives of your family. I mean, we have kids who are in their 50s, right, or, or more, maybe, but you know, we, we can still speak authoritatively into their lives, and we can certainly speak authoritatively into the lives of our grandchildren and great-grandchildren, you know, for those who have them. Uh, 
And, and that's our responsibility as, as patriarchs. Uh, also, you, you know, you sometimes starting uh, reading a chapter a day and journaling it, it can take quite a while to, to get uh, through the Bible and build that up. You should be doing that on a regular basis, but also supplement that. Supplement that with books about worldview, Christ, uh, biblical worldview and what's going on in the world today. And, um, and listening to uh, radio programs, or particularly nowadays, if you're into this, podcasts. There's two podcasts that I listen to every morning that keeps my biblical worldview sharp. One's called The Word, The World, and Everything in It. Comes from World Publications, the fourth largest weekly news magazine in the United States. Uh, the World and Everything in It, and the other is Breakpoint, and that comes from the Colson Center, if you remember Charles Colson. Uh, as you gain confidence in the worldview, look for opportunities to speak into the lives of your family. Look for those opportunities to talk to them about worldview. Talk to them about the fact that life is only exists here because of Creator God, that life is only sustained because of Creator God, that there's moral imperatives. Speak to them about those things and speak in the church when you have the opportunity about those things because we're a large church and uh, or relatively speaking, and we have lots of folks coming in from the outside, you know, and not all of them are carrying a biblical worldview like we have in here. Now, before I close here, I want to say that uh, I want to point out one thing that the Apostle Paul said through Charlie here this morning in this scripture. It was verse 20. It says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood how from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. Now, when Paul wrote that, it was really obvious. You looked around and, and you couldn't explain anything. Okay, and so Paul said, hey, just look at that and you know there's a God. Now, naturalism would say, no, no, you look at that and you conclude there is no God. Not true. All right? And there is uh, a, some wonderful resources to help you in that area and to guide your grandchildren to. Because remember, if your grandchildren are going to school, uh, public school all day long, and then sitting in front of the TV and the Internet, uh, they are saturated with naturalism. You can speak into their lives, but uh, there's some resources. Uh, Google Discovery Institute It's led by a brilliant guy named uh, Stephen Meyer, or, or just Google Intelligent Design, and you'll get some fabulous resources, interesting ones too, that you can take your grandkids to and help them to, uh, to understand what a biblical worldview is. Um, the Bible says, study to show thyself approved. Study to show yourself approved. That's talking to us. So we have to turn around and study, show ourselves approved. We can win this battle. We can win this battle, but we must win it. We must win it for the sake of our families. Amen? Amen. I know my sermon can, uh, can leave you feeling a little upset uh, given what's going on in the world today. Uh, I don't mean to, to do that, but we have to face truth. But I don't want you to be anxious about it. So our benediction uh, comes from Philippians 4. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will, keep your, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Jesus. Amen. Go in peace. Stay away from that COVID. <laughs>